Al Black with Chewing the Gristle. And my co-host, Tim Conroy. Hey, my brother Al. How you doing? Wonderful. It's bright, sunny, and chilly outside, but it's it's a great fall day. Our poet today, our guest poet, is Nancy Naomi Carlson. Welcome, Nancy. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here with Tim and Al, and um, I've heard so much about you guys. All good. That, that's surprising and wonderful. <laughs> Nancy Naomi Carlson is a poet, translator, essayist, and editor, as well as a recipient of two literature translation fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts. She has also received grants from the Maryland State Arts Council and the Arts and Humanities Council of Montgomery County. In 2018, she was decorated as a Chevalier of the Order of Academic Palms by the French government, author of four non-translated titles and six books of translations, her most recent full-length collection of poems, an infusion of violets, seagull books, was published in 2019 and was featured in the New York Times Book Review, New and Noteworthy, as well as reviewed by Elizabeth Lund in the Washington Post. Her first collection of poetry, King's Highway, was a co-winner for the Washington Writers Publishing House Competition. Complications of the Heart won the Texas Review Press Robert Phillips Poetry Chapbook Prize and in Perfect Seal of Lips was selected for the Tennessee Chapbook Prize. Tell us, uh, Nancy, about your, your poetry journey, where it began, who your influences are and were, how this all started for you. So I didn't start out to be a poet. I was a musician, played the piano, played the violin, <clears throat> the flute. And um, I always think of it as a perfect storm. All the things had to be in place. So I came to poetry a little later in life. Um, I had the, the music, and that's important for poetry. But I wasn't writing poetry. And um, I think what happened along the way was that I had a tragic thing happen at a young age with losing a baby. And for 20 years, I thought, what am I going to do? It, it haunted me. And then I picked up a book called Ended Beginnings, and it said, write a letter, letter to the, the baby who had died. So I did. And then it said, do something creative with it. And I thought, well, what am I going to do with that? I don't know. And then I thought, well, why don't I write a book and dedicate it to the baby, Matthew, and give him a presence in this world? And that sounded great, but I, I didn't really know how to write poetry. So I went to the Writer's Center in Bethesda and took a class and learned the mechanics, started writing. Um, the teachers there were very kind. They would say, well, maybe you should switch the last line to the title and switch it around. And I was like, no, this is my feelings. I'm going to get this out here. But eventually I thought if I'm going to write a book and not um, and, and get a publisher, I need to learn the craft. I need to just let go of myself and hear what everybody was saying. So I did, and the long and the short of it was that the, um, the, the book King's Highway appeared very musical. I, I pay a lot of attention to sounds. And um, it, I, then I thought superstitiously, if I stop writing, I won't be able to write again. So I wrote my way through a couple of chapbooks because I didn't want to stop. And uh, eventually translation came in. And because I was a French and Spanish teacher, that tied up the music of the ear in translating, the French-Spanish connection in there, the writing poetry that had happened. And none of that could have happened until everything was in place, like the perfect storm. And the translation, yes, has distracted me from my poems, I admit it. And it was 20 years 
until the second full length came out and infusion of violets, but it's out. And, um, and now I balance the two of them because they just, both of them are so important to me. So influences, I have to say, I've, I've got um, a degree in French language and literature, and I do not have one in English literature. I've taken maybe one class at the University of Maryland with Michael Collier. I was an auditor just to see. So I, I, I have spotty influences. We had to pick someone from each decade. And there was Ezra Pound and uh, William Carlos Williams. So I can talk that, but I can talk much better about French literature and talk about my favorites, Baudelaire and Rimbaud and Verlaine with all their sonorous sounds that come in. And so I try to make sure there's a sound going on, a sound thing in my poems. Um, I didn't really know any poets at the time. Um, I, I guess I was fortunate in finding a mentor. And my mentor was someone I met at the Writers' Center. So you never know where you'll find a mentor. And we hit it off. And she, she had a daughter named Nancy who had died. And um, she looked at everything I wrote and would give me feedback. And I would shop for her or help her with her, her tasks around the house. And it was amazing. Barry Armitage is her name, and she's a dear friend, but she really was the one who got me going. And though classes are wonderful, you're in with a, a lot of students, so you don't get that individual attention and individual encouragement. So she taught me to read widely. She gave me all her Georgia reviews and all her poetry magazines. And I would read to see what other writers were doing. Um, she encouraged me enough so I wouldn't say, well, forget it. This is too hard. I'm not going to do it. Um, and then when she felt she had done all she could for me, she passed me along. Now we're going south to Georgia to Stephen Corey at the Georgia Review, who was her friend. And for a small pittance, I would send him poems and he would rip them all to shreds. And a third of it, I would understand what he was saying and I could go and fix it. A third of it, it was, oh my gosh, um, I, see, I hear what you're saying, but I, I don't have it in me to do. I don't know how to make that happen. And a third of it was, I don't even know what he's saying. Uh, somebody bring in a translator because I, I, I don't even get that. But I think it's good to practice tennis with the net really high and um, it raises the bar. And so he was really, really tough. I must have sent him 200 poems and he liked one, one poem. And he said, oh, I would have published that in the Georgia Review, um, but I can't because I'm your mentor, so I won't. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh. So then I eventually, um, I, he was no longer my mentor, so I was able to submit work. I, I'm indebted to him, and I'm indebted to Breadloaf. I went once. I don't go to a lot of conferences, but that's another um, important thing in a writer's career is to, to network, meet people, hear what other people are writing, what they're saying. And um, I went to Breadloaf and got to meet some wonderful people with whom I'm still friends. And some of them were emerging at the time, and now they're huge names. And one of them took me under her wing, too, and looked at what I had written, um, MJ Bang, Mary Jo Bang. And she talked about her slash and burn method. So anything I wrote, she'd slash it and say, this isn't needed. That is not because she's she can be a minimalist. But she taught me how to really look at everything I wrote helping me shape my voice too, I think, at, looking back on it, so that I would know what appealed to me. You can take so much from everyone else, but ultimately you're the one who decides what's going to stay and how you'll express yourself and what kind of writer you'll become. So she was amazing. And, and then I had the good fortune of meeting Jeffrey Levine, and he runs Tupelo Press, but I knew him before he ever 
thought of Tupelo Press or one year before he ever thought of Tupelo Press. And he's been very generous with his his time and his brilliance in writing. Um, and so I, I, I still rely on him tremendously. So I think the, 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 the journey has been complicated. Um, it's the writing is not my day job. I'm no longer a French and Spanish teacher. Um, my field is counseling, um, a school counselor. And now I train counselors at Walden university. Um, it's online, so I don't have to go out. And, uh, I think that the balance, uh, the balance of counseling and writing, because the concept of empathy, empathy to be able to get in someone else's shoes and understand who they are, makes all the difference in both worlds. In counseling, we're trained that we have to, as counselors, have empathy towards our clients, towards our students, not only that, but we have to be able to demonstrate it so that the person seated across from us understands that we do understand and get them. And in poetry, especially translation, empathy is so key to be able to walk in someone else's shoes. How am I going to walk in the shoes of someone from Djibouti in Africa writing about civil war? But because I have that training, that works. And in my poetry, when I do persona poems or I try to um, get into someone else's head and bring their story into a poem, I have to really be able to understand it and care about them and empathize. So I think right now I'm leading a dual life. I'm counseling, but I'm writing and translating like never before. I, I don't leave the house. And that's a wonderful answer. And, and Nancy, let me just sort of follow up with the um, your job as translator. Um, I understand you have an article coming out soon in the Writer's Chronicle um, about how being a translator has sort of influenced your poetry. And, you know, to me, talking about being a counselor and the empathy, a translator may be a little bit you're counseling the world. <laughs> and, and so, you know, talk to us about that. That's a very interesting and intriguing concept, counseling the world. Giving, certainly giving the world something. I, I look at it more as giving voice to someone who needs to be heard, but then giving the world this voice. And there are so many writers out there that they say only 3% of the books published here our translations. And yet, who are we to say that the greatest literature is only written in English in the United States? So it's a huge mission of mine to, to bring these translations into English, but also to choose mostly marginalized voices, voices that are heard where they are originally written, who are prize winning, but may not be known in this country. And my, I started with a, a, a dead guy, René Char, a great, brilliant writer from the last century who fought in the French resistance and um, just had a heroic kind of life, who married a Jewish person when that was not what you would do. And um, translating a dead person, the difficulties are getting rights and Gallimard is the one that owns them in Paris and they charge for every poem you want to publish in a magazine. Um, they charge hundreds of dollars for rights for the book. So after I had finished that first book, I thought, let me get somebody alive. And I found Suzanne Dracius from Martinique. And she was amazing. She would work with me. Her English wasn't as good as her French, but she wanted everything precise and she would look at everything I wrote and she would give her opinion and she would um, consult with her son who spoke English and had an American girlfriend. And I got to travel to Fort de France and meet with her uh, on a grant, which was amazing. And then I met her a couple of times in Paris as well. And we're, we're friends, but I got her voice out there. She writes about the race and gender and talks about the black white continuum 
and she's very light skin with blonde red hair and she's called a Kalazaza. And the thing about it is that when she's in Paris, she's too dark skin to really fit in. But when she's in Martinique, she's too light skinned to fit in. So this is a really new kind of a marginalization that she's got going. So I translated her book of poetry and then uh, I translated, I co-translated her novel. Mm. I, I don't usually write prose. So you talk about influences. So here getting through hundreds of pages of this novel and I sound map everything. So I do the alliteration and assonances and it's color coordinated and it's painstakingly long for a poem. And you can imagine if it's for a novel and my co-translator who is actually married to my ex-husband, which is very interesting. She's native French. So she was there helping me along and we got this novel done. And the novel made me look at, I don't know, all of a sudden I started writing essays. And, and, that, and with René Schell, all of a sudden I was writing prose poems. And I hadn't done any of that. And you put yourself into what you translate. So I pick lyrical texts because I like the music of it. I don't throw lyricism into a text that isn't like that. I search for ones that, that will help me do something I enjoy. So it's a little self-serving. I enjoy getting those sounds in there. And then my, my, my translating life led me to Djibouti and to Abdurrahman Waberi, who actually, when I, I friended him on Facebook because I found him in a, in a great, anthology I'm, I'm thinking do i have this anthology here it's a marvelous one that patrick williamson edited and i found abdu and i thought oh let me meet Ab let me talk to abdu and we talked and it turned out he wasn't in djibouti he wasn't in paris he was teaching at gw university and at the time i was teaching at the university of the district of columbia and so we were only a metro stop away give or take so we met and he he's a, so spiritual, but not in any um, defined religious spiritual, though he does lean towards and does cite the Quran. And, um, but he, he's a mixture. He, he writes about Jews. He writes about rosaries. Um, and so he's become a, a, a good friend. We, we had had him over for Thanksgiving a couple of years back too. And then, I, I guess he was the one who brought me to Seagull Books. How your kid, you, you, you know, all these experiences um, you've digested, and, and this is who you are as a writer, and we, you know who you are as a poet. Really, is interesting to me. How how do you sort of describe your poetry style? So, not having grown up in the ranks of English majors and critiques and, and, and all. My style, as I see it, is usually described by someone else describing me. <laughs> and I go, oh, okay, wow, that's interesting. I never thought that. So apparently I am, I have very formalist leanings and villanelles are my go-to form. I love them. But what I do is I don't follow any rhythmic pattern per se. And I use slant rhyme and uh, instead of regular rhyme. And I am getting even more lenient with myself with feminine stresses at the end of a line and counting that as long as the stress syllable has the pattern. And I, and I used to write what I called pseudo sonnets, um, which were sonnets and they had rhyme pattern, slant rhyme. So I thought, okay, that that that's something slightly unique because I think it's important for a writer to have something that's theirs and my combination of obviously this strange way of coming to poetry combines these things and um, besides that I'm I'm very very controlled I don't like excess verbiage and words so that's the Mary Jo bang part of it that I'm, I'm hearing. I also try to be grammatically correct. And that's Stephen Corey. I don't have to be, but 
And, and then I try to let myself go. And more and more I see that not let myself go in, in terms of just spouting a lot of words, but just put my personality in there, a kind of wry humor. And I'm seeing more of that lately, too, in what I'm writing. Well, can we hear a couple points? I'm so glad you asked. So I'm going to read new ones right now. Um, this one just came out in Plume, Danny Lawless's wonderful journal Plume. And it was motivated because there was a dead tree in my front yard. It was alive and then it died. And I don't know how I missed it. And it was very distressing to know that. And there was no reason I still don't know but it inspired this poem. Sequoia, immune to lightning and arctic cold, floods and burning blasts of wind down Sierra Nevada slopes, everything nature can dish out. It was made to last 3,000 years and could have grown to 300 feet, could have survived another half millennium, Earth's largest on Earth, though saddled like the rest of us with time, could have succumbed to a natural end brought down by its own heft to the forest floor, a regal finding final resting place. There among the yellow pines, white firs, there where it had stood before native tribes surrendered its shade, before whale oil was rendered to light. But now, weakened by drought, stress, and fire, invaded by beetles carving elegant runes in its bark, it has died. Like Benke, a giant warrior monk standing upright. That's wonderful. And, and that of course was not my tree. My tree was a little maple, but, <laughs> but then I, I took myself to California. Can I read another? Please. All right. So I, I don't leave home. I haven't left home since March. I go to medical appointments when I have to, but I'm, I'm quarantined. My husband and I walk the dog and I garden, but that's it. But because, um, because of another experience of having breast cancer, the mammogram was due. So... I made that an exception of leaving the house, getting into the car and driving to do that. And I happen to have, don't tell anybody, I have some N95s um, because when I was in chemo, I had gotten them from the hardware store and you know, you, you keep them around just in case. You just, you wanna do everything superstitious so as not to have anything recur and knock on wood. Things are okay. So that's what prompted this poem, which um, I don't get I don't get to see much. I see my garden. <laughs> so that's that influences it. It's called Vigilance and it's coming out in five points. I don't think it's been published yet, but we looked at galleys. Vigilance. Like immortals, they're reborn every year despite the cutting back. My backyard hydrangeas rob the azalea's light, beautiful and deadly, laced with a compound that morphs into cyanide when consumed. Though dried and smoked, they yield a cheaper than pot high. My scientist's father never shared that trip with me, sticking to complacencies of soil and pH acidic to yield true blue and alkaline for pink. Were he still alive, I'd have shared how I mistook a magnified view of COVID-19 for hydrangea with their clustered cells, like the mutinous clutch taken from my right breast after he died. After months of kill cure in my veins, then rads burning through the tumor bed, Six years of screenings and self-exams, looking for that thing you so don't want to find. My annual mammogram pilgrimage came due. Early pandemic, I put off the visit. 
cobwebs collecting beneath the side view mirrors of my car. But July brought a flattened curve and a lull in Maryland deaths led me to don a mask from my chemo stash and hold my breath as images bloomed on the digital screen, cloudy as Saharan dust now on its northerly trek, swirling its plume to feather our sunsets with shades of scattered light. It becomes a story uh, of more than just uh, and just your visit to the doctor. As, as uh, a poetry and one who you said, people say you're very controlled. Um, you said you're very controlled. How They're much not controlling? Yeah, <laughs> not well, controlling uh, How much revision do you do? And when do you know that your poem is finished? So I teach at the Writers' Center, and that R word, everyone hates that word because no one, we're done. I've said it, it's done, it's on paper, I'm out of here. And I'm exactly the opposite. And it takes, oh, even to sit down and write, the buildup takes so long because I have to start with a thought and think about it all week as I'm doing my day job and, and wait for Friday night to be able to sit and try to write. Nothing ever happens. And then I look at it Saturday and then it clicks a little. And then I keep working on it. I'm working on something that I started two weeks ago and it's being written piecemeal, which is unusual because usually it's good to just get something out there. But then I look at it again. And I look at it with morning eyes. I write better late at night at one or two in the morning. But then the morning shows me whether that stuff is just ridiculously verbose and terrible. And oh my gosh. So I look at it and then I put it aside for a few days and look at it again and then see some things. And I get a sense of, is this really done or not? I really have that. And I go, I want it to be done. I think it could be done, but I know it's not. And then I share it with a few close friends for their input and get the input of the feedback is important, but it's only as important as you absorb it yourself, are not defensive and see if there's something of value in it. And I'm looking for ways to make the poem better. So I listen to what's being said. Sometimes I bristle and don't want to hear that, but then I look. And then I let it sit a little more. So you're talking about sometimes a long time in revision. And finally, it gets to a way that I think it's done. And then I look at it a few days later and it's still done. And then a week later and it's still done. And then I know. And if it's a villanelle, I know it way before because you mess with a villanelle, you mess with the whole poem and it's shot. So if it's working and it's getting where it should be, then yes, um, it's done. And don't even tell me what to do with it. So for me, I think to write my best and maybe for most people that it's important to really let it sink in and look at and look at each word. Mary Jo Banks said each word should be theater or maybe said each line should be theater. And I think of that and I look because we so often put exposition in versus image imagery and we weigh down the poems telling the reader where we are, what's happening. And that whole thing with the show don't tell that I teach in the classes. But if you can show it with your images, then you can slash and burn all that exposition and get to the crux of what's happening in the poem. Mm -hmm. And I think if you can tell a story in the poem, it makes for a better poem to read at a reading. Not all poems have to tell a story. I, I tend to like telling stories if I can. And researching. So researching something I didn't know about that warrior Benke. Um, I really didn't know much about redwoods until I read a tree, uh, an article about how they're dying. There are 18 of them dead, just standing up there. Um, so even after writing the poem, you can infuse facts. Stanley Plumley said every poem should have at least one fact in it. 
something that the reader goes, I didn't know that. And I think I, I try to get more than one poem in there, more than one fact in the revision process, in the actual creation process. So revision, I think, is our friend and getting feedback from others as to clarity and getting past, I wrote it, this is the way it is. I'm not looking at it again. It'll do. But you can't change a person's personality either. So if that's how people feel as a teacher, you have to let them be who they are too. You can merely suggest, merely have them go through the experience and see if after revising, they're more pleased with what they've written. Hmm. How would you like to share two more poems with us? Oh, I would love to. I'm going to, since I talk about villanelles, I'm going to read a villanelle. And uh, those villanelles with those repeated lines, for me, once you get the repeated lines, it it works. And um, that it takes a while to get those two repeating lines. And um, whenever someone says, we need you to write a poem about such and such. My daughter runs a, a community choir and she said, we need you to write a poem about uh, the planets, Jupiter. And so I'm like, I don't write on demand. I can't do that. But I wrote, I wrote a poem about Juno, but I made it a villanelle, which is not what I'm going to read. But that's the long buildup for it. I find that comforting to know that I can map it out. And once I have my two lines, put them in each of the stanzas of 19, it's 19 lines, and then they have to appear together at the end. So then all I have to do is fill in the blanks with not too many lines. So I love the form. So this is another um, breast cancer poem. And it was it's a villanelle. And the title, I hate coming up with titles. So it was such a relief that um, I had four rounds of chemo. So this is infusion round three. Didn't have to think of that title. Infusion round three. A coded language emerged from a morpheme sea. Hyperplasia, exemestane, nuclear grade. Charm times are not evoked in threes. Three weeks between infusions, reprised in frayed dreams of the needle's wake. A broken language emerges. A lymph sea reels with vertigo. Red blood cells retreat. I am bald and moon-faced. Where's the harm in threes, cytoxin whispers, corroding nails as it seethes drip by drip in recalcitrant veins. A muted language merges with closed seas of blood so pale, a slight shift of disease could set off a swell so untamed that evoking three times three times three charms may not be enough to save me. My body knows how it will end, but remains, with or without charm times evoked in threes, a veiled language merging with closed seas. That's lovely. That's just lovely. That form really works with that poem. Thank you. I, I think having something that works with the form Three. So if your your theme is something with threes, Villanelle is a good go-to or something repeated or some grieving or some obsession. And Villanelle seem to, to do that. And maybe I'll read something lighter. I went to a, a class at a college. I sometimes come in as guest poet and um, I read some Adam and Eve poems. And one of the students said, would you have eaten the apple? So I wrote this poem based on his question. Fabled fruit. Who could fault Eve's right to know? Her sin-filled heart exposed, grounded day after day by the same sweet earth. How to resist a flawless skin so impurely pure? No Snow White, would I still have reached for the crimson side? My reflection cast raw in its shine. Forsake my faith for a taste of what I didn't own. 
maybe a lick? Or would I have spit out the first breached mouthful, wiping the juice from my lips with a guilty hand? Some say figs were Eve's downfall, phallic and hidden beneath luxurious leaves. Or maybe pomegranates, thick with caverns of seeds. But I'll stick with the fruit that led to the Trojan War. The apple of gold, symbol of greed, thrown to the fairest to seed discord. In the end, used to having my way, I'd have Adam take the first bite. Just as Lot let his wife look back first. That's awesome. That's wonderful. I wanted but, to say, could I say one thing about um, this book, the and, and Infusion of Violets? This book was designed in India, in Calcutta. That's where Seagull is. And Abdul Rahman was the one who said, Seagull wants to publish my translations. Do you want them to do that? And and I, I've never heard of Seagull. It's not a US based place. But it turned out my friends were publishing with Seagull and they are distributed by University of Chicago Press. Um, so I thought, why not? So that started a relationship of two Wabeli poems and he published the novel translation. And then I asked him, would he publish my own collection of poems? He, the, the press doesn't. They, they have translations and these world famous writers. And he, he said, yes. Um, which made me cry because it, it was such a su such a gesture of of confidence in my work. And he also paid for me to come to Calcutta and give a master class in translation there. So translation for me has been life changing in ways that I wouldn't have imagined doors would open. And yet it's tied up with my own poetry as well. So everything goes hand in hand there with the translation and the, the poetry. I cut you off. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I, I, it, it really prompts another question about your collection because you you know you mentioned earlier it was it was twenty years in the making, you know. And so, when did you know you had uh, the cohesion for the collection, the vision for the collection? When did that come together? That's a very good question because I think. I was lost in the world of translation and I don't know. See, that's, that is a good question. What told me that I had this, that I had it all. You need a, a certain number of poems that are good poems to be in a book. You got to toss out the stuff that's just holding that are placeholders. You, I guess, I guess what made it happen is that, um, well, the, the, an infusion of violets, that title, that poem was written years ago in Taos with a, in a workshop with Valerie Martinez talking about the centrifugal poem because mine tend to narrow down, but I wanted to learn how to open up. And so I wrote a poem about a student being a member of a gang um, who has HIV because I would hear my students' stories and I made a composite. And it was called An Infusion of Violets because I picture him with violets growing through his skeleton laid out in grass, the sign of the cross, then a sugar skull head, but these violets infusing. So I had written that, but the, the collection didn't have a shape until I had chemotherapy. And then all of a sudden, chemo is an infusion, the violets are an infusion. I had written some poems about tea and my father and his dementia and so all of a sudden it all clicked and it became a cohesive whole rather than a bunch of poems that i i'd written and then i thought this is really working and clicking and let's see with that as the basis what i'm going to toss out what i'm going to do I need to write any new poems? I, I hear my writer friends who are very well established and they go, oh yes, I'm writing a new poem to fit in because that's the missing link. And I don't think I did that. I, I just went through everything I wrote and said, well, what, what could fit in there and be that, that link there? And then all of a sudden I had this book and um, 
same book that I've been sending out in various forms. I had been sending it out and getting rejected, but then all of a sudden I believed in the book and it all came together. Who are you reading now and, and who is fueling your imagination? So I'm, I'm torn. The empathic person I am, I have to read my friends' books, even if they're not, not what I normally would be drawn to. They're my friends. And so I want to read it and see what they're writing. And usually I'm very pleased at what there, there is, but I, I try to, um, I try to read the journals. So I have a stack of journals that I subscribe to and like to see. I, I read cover to cover Georgia Review. I have been for years um, because you get a variety of voices. But now the editorship has changed and it's a new direction. But I like reading that, too, and seeing how an editor takes a magazine that's been around for so long and makes it go in a different direction. I have collections of people I admire and I have to read their books. So in my pile, there's a Michael Collier book and a, an Elizabeth Spires book. Um, I, I also read Southern Review, the Southern Review. I enjoy reading that pretty much cover to cover. Um, Agni as well. I, I enjoy that. The writers there, so uh, I guess because so much of my life now is is with arts advocacy too, not quite on on your you guys level, but because um, I just recently co-edited co-edited uh, an anthology called "101 and One Jewish Poems for the Third Millennium," and Matthew Silverman approached me and said, would I like to be co-editor? And I've never co-edited an anthology. So all of a sudden I was reading, we, we had 800 poetry submissions and we had to get through it of huge names and emerging voices. And we wanted that anthology to be that way. So I got to really interact with some of these writers and especially the high flyers, Jane Hirschfield, Ed Hirsch, David Lehman, Ilya Kaminsky, they're in that anthology, which is coming out in um, January. But this back and forth. So then, of course, I want to read their books, their most recent books. So Ilya's Deaf Republic is on my pile. Um, it's easier to just read piecemeal in a, in a journal. And then you read one or two poems and you do it right in the early morning when you're most able to read things and understand them. So I have so many books that I want to be reading, but I make sure that I am reading the journals, the ones that I feel I would like to be in or have been in, and, and I like the editor's taste. Um, and for before all that, that was the, before reading, it was all French literature for, to get that degree. I had to read over a hundred books in French fiction and novels and plays. And it's in my mind to read more plays too. I'd like to translate a play. So I have so many, I'm pulled so many different ways. So with my own writing, thank goodness with the pandemic, I have focused on my writing and I've been writing almost a poem a week. It's incredible. Uh, and I don't like to go on to the next poem until the other one is almost done or put on the shelf. But then translation, Okay, French is great, and um, I've I've done francophone folks. And after Waberi, there was Alain Maboncou from Congo Brazzaville, an, an amazing novelist. I think he was twice on a list as a finalist for Man Booker. And now I'm I'm translating Louis Philippe d'Alembert from Haiti. But I'm also co-translating with someone you've had on the show before. Um, with Esperanza Hope Snyder, we are co-translating Spanish and we're translating a wonderful Cuban woman and her work. Uh, so that's exciting. And then I'm friends with a Swedish writer's daughter, Stieg Dagerman, 
Stieg lived in in the last century and wrote a novel a year. And by age 31, he had written so many novels, so many poems, and then he killed himself. I think he got caught up with the World War II angst there. But his daughter was three when he died, and she and I met with our day jobs. And so I've translated Swedish with her. And, and that's amazing. So there's so much pulling at me to do. Um, I, I have my life here. I'm in my study, but everything I'm doing is on a clipboard because that's the only way I can keep it all straight. Right. I'm translating, oh, a fairy tale from a, a Congolese writer as well. That's on the top and that's with the, the color coordinating sound mapping. But I can only keep straight everything if it's if it's neatly organized and I don't have to go looking for things like that. So um so you ask what I'm reading and I I'm I'm making sure I am as whenever I get a moment, but I'm also juggling everything else there too. Listeners, how they can get hold of your collections. So the the easiest way is to go on the um on my, my website, which is www.nancynaomicarlson.com. And my co-translator and married to my ex-husband designed it for me. So she has pictures of the books and um, all, all details. Um, and there's also a, um, a contact the person and they can email me about any questions they may have. Seagull Books has the Seagull Books on the website. Amazon has Amazon. Uh, they, they have most of the books, though I think there's there, there's a movement towards really giving our money to small booksellers. And the, the books are part of SPD. Um, the anthology was apparently a November bestseller for SPD, and it's not even out yet which was astonishing to me. That's great. I don't even know how that works. But so booksellers, uh, SPD are, are great places to go. Um, yeah, so they, they don't have to look too hard to find them. Well, how about reading two last poems? Okay. I'm going to read a translation. This is Naming the Dawn, and it's Abdurrahman Waberi's work. And he, it's a very spiritual Sufi-like um, collection. So this this is in Naming the Dawn, and Shunandini is the graphic artist. She's in that little office of four, designing all the book covers, and she's done. She did the violet. She did this, and it's amazing. So I feel like it's almost a work of art holding it. This one is called Vanity. It's easy to fritter your life away bit by bit without even being aware. I desire and deserve it all, the odd arithmetic of ignorance. I fear misfortune with all the force of my life, yet I run toward it, mouth and arms open. The din of the herd is more ingrained than each individual's joy. That is so powerful. And then this one is um, actually, you know, how I'm supposed to picture you all not wearing clothes so I won't be nervous. Um, <laughs> this one, you, you can picture me not wearing clothes, but don't. And there's a, a my ex-husband had done a nude of me that's hanging up in the bedroom. And it's called Odalisk, the poem. Nude like a Matisse lounged under the hard eyes of years, semi-reclined in a slat-backed chair draped in green, passing for silk, her then-husband artist could ill afford. In the upper left, a 70s Brookland view with slow to gentrify homes robed themselves in muted citrus. A patch of sky modeled baby blue a sign her second child would die the day he was born. 
her eyes look down, allowing us to sip at leisure her curves, the creamy expanse on her left, relieved by the areola's blush, nipple not yet nursed by a child, nor pierced by a sentinel node probe, or what cannot be foretold. Cells gone deeply wild in the ducts of her breast, their telltale sonic tracks only exposed to the trained naked eye scalpels thrusts goading the too close heart then once again doubling the old suture line leaving a scar nearly unseen but for that extra pucker of skin as if taking in a blouse and taking us in she lets us know she knows she will always look the same Wonderful. This has been a wonderful interview. We want to thank our poet and translator and essayist, Nancy Naomi Carlson, for being our guest today. Thank you. And thank you for letting me be on here with you. You guys are great. Your interview questions are just perfect and I, I think what you're doing is such a great service for the poetry community, bringing writers, poets to the public. Thank you.